I have learned that sometimes you don't have to debate the atheists and you don't have to debate the, 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 the uh, 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 agnostics and all these people. Sometimes you have to de- debate TV evangelists. I've talked to Christians and, and, and sometimes we're having a debate and I'm trying to help them understand what, what, what I believe the scripture is trying to portray. But sometimes TV evangelists take it and portray it a, a different way and they take it for truth. And you're spending more of your time trying to revert the thinking that the TV evangelists put in their mind. I I remember one time I went to a nursing home. Let me tell you how humbling this was. I went to a nursing home to preach. You know, we had been there many a times, and, and sometimes there was... Uh, 10 people there. Sometimes there was 50 people there. There was times where the families were visiting and they would come and our church would go out there and we would sing for however long and then we'd do a, a small devotion or, or, uh, or a small sermonette, so to speak. We got in there and there was one person in there. There was about 10, 12, 15 of us and one person in that room and it was a fairly good sized cafeteria. And I said, hey, no big deal. So we're singing, and she was into the singing. She was sitting there just kind of, you know, bouncing her head a little bit. And, and, uh, and, and, and she was functional as far as she knew. You know, she had her mind. She knew what was going on. And as it was my turn to go preach, I went up there to begin going through the Scripture and the Word. And, and, and I'm kind of looking at her, and I'm not trying to stare at her, you know, because she's the only one in there. And I don't want to be like, hey, like I'm preaching just to you. So, you know, I'm kind of looking around and Looking back a little bit because everybody's with me is behind me. So she's sitting out there by herself and um, I'm preaching. All of a sudden I just see her do this and she's sitting back and she's getting comfortable. And all of a sudden she's. And then she gets up a little bit and then back down. So for about 10 minutes I sat there and she was asleep and I thought. But I was supposed to preach. I'm going to keep preaching anyway. So I preached her to sleep and. You want to talk about humbling. Once I did that, I knew I could preach in, to anybody. I, 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 there's times I felt preaching to the tree. And I thought, hey, it would listen just like that lady did that morning. So humbling experience. But you know, it's, it's those humbling experience that God prepares us for what he wants us to do. Those, it's those, in those moments that he prepares us for things, uh, you know, for for. Places that he wants to put us, you know, I, I always thought, often thought about worship, you know, as we started here and, and how there was times I had to lead worship for a season. And, you know, if you would have known me before, I would have never done it. And, and, but God prepared me through, through the time. He gave me opportunities until the time came that he opened up a door for me to do that for a season. But uh, just, it's, just, it's awesome how God works in our lives. It's awesome how God does things in our lives that, that opens doors of opportunity for us. How he prepares us and molds us and equips us for taking steps that we don't know we're going to be taking. That we don't know what's coming. And, and, and that's in, in a sense, that is how we can put our trust in him. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 says this says, trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. To trust in the Lord. Father, I just thank you this morning, Lord. I pray that the words that are spoken this morning, Lord, just build us up, Lord. That they let us look to you, Lord. That these words are words of the Spirit this morning, not of my own flesh, your own uh, uh, opinion, Father. But of your word, Lord, that it may come forth and be truth, Lord. And speak to the hearts of those that need it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible tells us to trust in the Lord with all thy heart. What does it mean to trust into something? What does it mean to trust into the Lord? And I began to put some thought together and I thought about believing in the Lord is how we can put our trust in. Having confidence in the Lord is how we put our trust in. Confiding in the Lord is how we put our trust. Because you know if you trust something, you, you tend to confide in that. If you have somebody you trust, 
that you, you want to, uh, you're going through a battle, you're going through something, and you have someone you truly trust, and you can go to that person, and you can confide in that person, because you can trust that person is not going to take it to use against you. You can trust that that person is not going to take what you've told them to go and slander you behind your back. You can trust that person is going to listen to you and not try to fix you. Amen? When we believe in God, that we believe that he will do what he's promised he said he would do. It's how we put our trust in God. When we look at the word of God and we go to the Bible and we say, do I truly believe what this word says? And do I truly believe that he's going to do what he says in this word? That's how we put our trust in the Lord. We believe that God is the way of salvation and that there is no other way. Because see, the world wants to find another way of salvation. They want to find another way to be right with God, yet keep their sin in their life. They want to find a way that they can say, I am religious and I follow the laws. I, I'm a good person. I'm doing all these things. And basically, I don't really need God in my life. They want to find a different way. Jesus speaks of that when he says that the thief cometh, tries to come another way. The one that comes another way is like a thief. And they want to keep their own plan for their life. And in thus, they don't want to deny themselves and follow Christ. Because isn't that what it's all about? Isn't it, isn't it following Christ in the, in, the, in, the, in the grand scheme of all what the Bible tells us? And the end result is to deny yourself, your plans, your desires, your will, to give that up, to trust and follow Christ. Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Amen? And it tells us, so we put our trust in the Lord with all our heart. All this is putting our trust in the Lord. I looked up the word trust, and I, and I was kind of just, just harping on this word trust. And, and I went and got the definition, and the definition says, a reliance on the integrity. That means to rely on the integrity, the strength, the ability, and the surety of a person or thing to have confidence in. So when I started to think about that, I want to talk about these three, the integrity, the strength, and the, abil and the ability, and the confidence of the Lord. I want to talk about these four things this morning as we're talking about the word trust, as we're looking to how do we put our trust in God, because it's important. It's important to know how we put our trust in God. James Merritt, quote, I quoted him, he said this, he said, your relationship with Christ can only go as deep as your trust in Christ. So as you want to grow into Christ, as you want to grow with the Lord, your trust, you have to be able to put your trust deeper in him to be able to say lord i'm truly trusting that you're going to lead my steps that when i fail you i can go and ask for forgiveness and you're going to draw me back to you that when i that, 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 that the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the lord that in the decisions i make i want to make them for your glory church your trust your your relationship with christ only goes as deep as you put your trust in him if your trust is deep in Christ, your relationship will be deep in Christ. Your, your, the foundation of your relationship with him will be strong. You say, well, why is that important? Well, let me tell you why it's important. It's important this morning because many people, Christians included, have lived life. Pastor Ron said it, that we live life. It's life that we battle at times. He talked about it a little bit this morning. But... We live this life and sometimes people feel as though God has failed them. But people live and feel as though God has failed them. I talk to these people and they're a lot of times they're Bible believing Christians that have not necessarily gone astray, but sometimes have the wrong thinking. You know, they think of they they, they kind of put God in their box and say, okay, God, this is how I portray that you are. This is how I portray that you work and operate. And, and then they kind of put God in their box and they say, this is how God works. And sometimes they develop the wrong thinking toward God. And when things happen, they feel as though God has failed them. 
Well, the Bible tells us, well, we are to put our things, you know, we can't just put our trust in Christ when things are doing good, because that's easy. Isn't it easy to trust God when everything is good? I, you know, I, I, I have learned something just this week. I have learned that sometimes you don't have to debate the atheists and you don't have to debate the, 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 the uh, 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 agnostics and all these people. Sometimes you have to debate TV evangelists. It's the truth. I am being honest. I've talked to Christians, and, and, and sometimes we're having a debate, and I'm trying to help them understand what, what, what I believe the Scripture is trying to portray, but sometimes TV evangelists take it and portray it a, a different way, and they take it for truth, and you're spending more of your time trying to revert the thinking that the TV evangelists put in their mind. I told, <laughs> I told somebody this week, I said, go home and cut your TV off and don't listen to another TV evangelist you know, I'll, I'll refer you to some preachers, but stop listening to these guys. When Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job said, I'm going to trust him even though, and we know the story of Job, and I'm not going to harp on his story right now and go there because I want to take this to a, a different direction right now. But even though Job was going through the worst of the worst, he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That my trust is going to continue to be on him because, see, we forget, church, in our life that we were bought with a price. The Bible tells us that our life is not our own. That sometimes when things happen, we have to be careful in our thinking about God has not necessarily failed us, but that God is trying to grow us. That God is trying to allow things in our life because I will tell you, and I have seen it from my own firsthand experience, that when, God, when things are going well in your life, it's so easy for you to get relaxed. It's so easy for you to get rested in your Christian walk. And if you're not careful, your eyes begin to wander. Your mind begins to wander. Your hands and your feet begin to wander. And you begin to find yourself drawing away from what you were drawn to. Jesus put it like this in Revelation as he told the church, he said, you've lost your first love that you've been drawn away so if we're not careful if God doesn't allow things to happen in our life now I will tell you sometimes these things hurt sometimes there is pain involved but we have to not get the thinking that God is against us that God has failed us that we have we have turned the uh, God against us and now we are considered his enemy because I believe this kind of thinking happens. I believe when things, and, and, and I'm, I'm trying to be very careful here because I was struggling with this message. Because I will tell you, there's times where you preach these things and you have to walk in them. And I want to make sure that as I preach this and, and, and God, God allows this message to come forth, that I'm not sounding uh, uh, better than thou. Because I'm not. What I'm trying to portray here, what I'm trying to say is that sometimes we have to remember that when we're going through things, that it's not that we're going through them because God is against us. It's not that he's turned away from them. Sometimes God says, hey, I have to allow these things for you. Because if I don't, you'll stray. But if I allow these things, you're going to come to me. Because let me tell you, you, we will all agree. You cannot disagree with me in this, that growing comes in pain. You take, you, take, you take kids, children, for example, when they grow, what do they have? Growing pains. They don't feel good. They, you know, the children cry, and you're like, oh, just get over it. It's just growing pains, you know, to go away. But it hurts. But they grow in those pains. We as Christians are no different. We grow in pain. Sometimes trials, struggles, and not that everything has to be, you know, so drastic, but sometimes there are times where Pastor Ron uh, alluded to this morning about people that have lost children or lost family members or things that have happened. But Jesus tells us in his word that he will never leave or forsake us, but he will be with us always. But so many people feel that when they go in time of struggle that they can't find God. And you know, I think sometimes we just forget who Christ is, or we forget who we are in Him. We forget who we are in Christ. 
That when the Bible says we're overcomers, that we're more than conquerors, that he, he uh, in Psalms it talks about him basically putting us in his, that he's our shield, he's our, co- our buckler. We forget about these things when we're going through struggle because we feel so alone. We feel like it's us against the world that God has, that we have failed God, we have messed up, and now God has failed us, and he has turned from us, and we are lost and gone into the wilderness, and we feel alone. And I think we forget sometimes that the Holy Spirit is working in us to give us that we have. Listen, when the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, you have the strength, you have, you have the ability to draw from the strength of the Lord. When the Holy Spirit is working in you, you have the ability to overcome things in your life. When the Holy Spirit is working in you, you have the ability to endure things that you go through in your life. When you have the Holy Spirit working in you, you are able to gain peace and love and control in these in, in, in struggles in our life. When the Holy Spirit is working. But sometimes we put the Holy Spirit on the bench and we say, let me take care of this. I got this. Let me figure this out. Let me work on this. Let me, let me, basically, we go against what the scripture said is put, putting your trust in the Lord with all your heart. We begin to put our trust in ourselves. Or we begin to draw from other people as we put our trust in other people who we think can lead us out of the wilderness. And sometimes they get us more lost than where we were when we first started. We have to get to a place in our life, church, where we stop looking at ourselves, that we stop looking. You know, I, I, I came even in my own life. I've come to places where I said, all right, Lord, I give up. I surrender. I've tried to do it my way for long enough, and, and, and it's broke me. You got me. You have my attention. If you were trying to get my attention, you have it now. I give up. I surrender. I give it to you because I can no longer do it in myself. It's wearing me out. It's driving me down. And I can't even look up anymore. We get to those places in our walk at times. And I believe sometimes God allows us to go so far, even as believers, he allows us to go so far just to say, you give up now. Come on back home. Come on back home where I'm at. Come on back to where I have peace and rest for you that I can give you strength to overcome and endure because you're going through a hard time. Because we have to know that our hope is not in our goodness. It's not in our work. It's not in our church attendance. It's not in what we give. It's not in what we do. But our hope is in Christ alone. I love that song that says, in Christ alone, my hope is found. If you've ever heard that song, I just, I love that song, in Christ alone. But some people may feel that God has failed them. That things should have played out differently. And and they they didn't happen the way they thought. And and sometimes if we're not careful and we begin to have these thinking, we, we, we start to what the scripture says, Well, it says, lean not unto thy own understanding in verse 5, but that's what we begin to do. We begin to try to rationalize God. We begin trying to figure out what happened. I have had so many people, like Pastor Ron alluded to again this morning. He's, you know, we talked, we've had so many people, they tell you, well, I pray. You know, I read my Bible. I go to church, and I just can't figure it out. I can't understand what is going on. And see, we start to lean to our own. We try to figure out the mind of God. We start trying to understand the mind of God. We start trying to figure out, all right, God, what are you trying to accomplish? What are you trying to do? Where have I failed that you've allowed this to happen? Isaiah 55 says this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts higher, or I'm sorry, my thoughts than your thoughts. Go down to verse 11, Anthony. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So listen what he's saying. That last part of the verse. Look what it says. It says my, well, he says, he says, it shall not return to me void, talking about his word, but it shall accomplish, look, 
It shall, his word shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing. In the thing. Well, let me tell you, we all have a thing that we're battling. We all have a thing that we're dealing with. We all have that thing that we're struggling with, we're fighting against. Whatever it may be, it could be, like we alluded to, the loss of a family. It could be sin. It could be a struggle. You, we all have that thing. But the Lord says, but my word shall not, the word that come forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it will accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing that I sent it. That means that thing you're dealing with, the Lord has a word for it. That thing that you're struggling with, the Lord has a word for it. That thing that you're going through, the Lord has a word for it. And I want to tell you this morning to encourage you that we are able to put our trust in the Lord, not because of us, because we have that thing that we're dealing with, and God says, I have a word for it to get you through, to prosper you. Give the Lord praise this morning. You can liven up a little bit. Some of you were here for the first service, but you ain't dead yet. Not yet. But he says that thing, where into I sent it. Everyone has that thing. You know, and when, and when we go into the word, I think of people like Naomi. Naomi, 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 however you want to say it. But I think of Naomi. And if you think of her and Ruth, well, I, before I get to the scripture, if you think about her, you know, if you ever read the book of Ruth and you think about her, it talks about her, how she lost her husband. And in the span of 10 years, uh, from what I've studied, in the span of 10 years, she lost her husband and two sons. Her husband and two sons. And she was left with two daughter-in-laws. I hope they had a good relationship. That would have been a struggle. Some of y'all don't get that. Everybody gets it along with their in-laws. But she lost her husband and her two sons. And I want you to read what she said. Put that up, uh, Ruth 120. Listen what she said. And she said unto them, call me not Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Now if you understand in the scripture, names mean things. Naomi's name meant pleasant. Maybe she had a pleasant spirit about her. Maybe she was one of them women that just she must have because her daughter-in-laws loved her very deeply. Ruth didn't want to leave her, and if you read in, her, in the scripture, Ruth said, hey, I'm going to stay with you, and your people are going to be my people, and your God's going to be my God. Basically, what you have, I want. I want to stay with you. So she had a pleasantness about her, but after all these things had happened, she said, don't call me Naomi anymore. Don't call me pleasant. She wanted to change her name to bitter because she said the Lord has dealt very Bitterly with me. So she began her battle. She began fighting. She began to go through a struggle. She probably felt at some point, where have I failed you, God? Or maybe because she was bitter, she probably thought, God, you have failed me. I wasn't, I was doing everything the right way, but you have failed me. You've taken away my husband. You've taken away my kids. And I have no one left. And as you begin to read, I want you to read. And if you read the story, I don't, again, I'm not, I'm just kind of going over this because I want to continue in another way. But if you continue reading, Ruth 4, 14 says this. Now, after all these things happen, you know the story that Ruth began to meet Boaz and, and, and all these things begin to take place. And uh, it, it says here, verse 14, and the woman said unto Naomi, blessed be the Lord, which has not, listen, which has not left thee this day without a kinsman that his name may be famous in Israel. Now it's talking about Boaz here in verse 15. Listen. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life. So here there was a point in her in time in her life that she was angry and bitter because of what had happened. She was looking at her circumstances and her situation. But God began to work in her life and in the lineage of her family and all these things. And he said... And he shall be a restorer of thy life. A restorer of Naomi. And listen. It also talks about that she did go back. Her name, they did call her Naomi. She did get her name back. God restored her 
in the midst of a terrible situation, God restored her. He was a restore. He sent a restore of her life. And if you know the, the story in the end, you know, they gave uh, Boaz and Ruth had Obed and Obed begat Jesse and Jesse begat David. God was working something bigger in Naomi's life that she couldn't see. But she had to trust God for it. He was working something greater than she could imagine. But she had to trust God for it. She had to look to him and lean not unto her own understanding. Because the more she looked to herself and tried to understand why God was doing what he was doing, the bitter she became. The bitter she became. And we do the same thing. We're guilty of the same thing. I'm guilty of the same thing. Of, of You're sitting here saying, all right, God, I'm going through the struggle of, of work and trying to provide for my family. Be the father you want me to be. Be the husband you want me to be. Be the minister, the leader you want me to be. You know, I, and, and I, sometimes these things can become overwhelming. And you begin to look to yourself and things begin to happen. And you say, Lord, I failed you. Or you failed me. Where did we go wrong? And it's only for God to draw us back to him. And say, you just come back here. Let me give you the peace that I have for you. Let me give you, let me restore thy life. I think of John the Baptist. Now, we often don't think of John the Baptist. And I'll be honest with you, I never really realized this in the scripture. Um, I guess it never really shot out to me until I, I heard a minister preaching on this. And it just kind of stuck out. About John the Baptist. We know him as the forerunner of Christ. He preached the coming of the Messiah. He preached the coming of Christ. And he saw the day that Jesus came. And he told Jesus. You know I'm not even worthy to baptize you. And Jesus said no John you're going to. I'm paraphrasing. He said no John you're going to baptize me. He said okay. So he baptized Jesus. And, and he knew that he saw Christ come. And then in Mark it even tells us. That the heavens opened up. And the spirit like a dove descending upon Christ. And the voice from heaven said come. And, and say this is my son. And, and who I am well pleased. And John saw all these things unfold. He knew from the beginning what he was supposed to be doing. And then he did it. And he watched all these things happen when Jesus was baptized. And got to see the heavens open up and the voice from heaven speak. And all these things. John was present. In Mark 1.14. Anthony doesn't have this. But in Mark 1.14. It goes on to say that after all these things unfold. What do you think happened to John? After all these things happened, the Bible tells us that he went to prison. After all these things happened, he went to prison. And he spent probably, I'm guessing, maybe roughly a year and a half in prison. And Matthew 11, 2 takes us here. Listen, it says, now when John heard, now this is John in prison. When John heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and he said to him, are thou he that should come or do we look for another? Now listen, listen. Think about John here. I just told you he baptized Christ. He saw the heavens open up. He saw the spirit descending upon Christ like a dove. He heard the voice say, this is my son in who I'm well pleased. He went to prison and in prison, I believe he began to struggle. He began to struggle. Why? How do you know? Well, the Bible says he sent his disciples to Christ and said, hey, are you the one we were waiting for? Or should we look for someone else? And let's see what Christ says. Verse four. And Jesus answered and said unto him, go and show John again those things which you do and hear and see. Or those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to him. But this is the verse that just blows my mind. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Do you know what Christ was saying? He was saying, John. Listen to what, I just, I love this answer. Blessed is he Whosoever is not offended because of me. Ultimately, Christ didn't Bible beat John. He didn't get upset that he said, oh, are you doubting who I am? He didn't get upset at John, but he sent this, this message. He said, but tell him 
All these things that John knew would be taking place when the Messiah came. He knew people, uh, I believe John knew that the blind would receive their, their sight, the lame would walk, the lepers be healed, all these things the deaf would hear. But he said, blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. But I believe that he knew right then that he was saying, John, everything that you said was coming is coming to pass. Don't get discouraged. Don't get all bent out of shape. I have a plan that's taking place and everything is in my control. Everything is in my control. And John, I knew John, he, he must, that, that word blessed is though who's not offended. Because let me tell you, it's the people. It's this, it's this scripture right here that will separate the believers from the posers. Can I say the posers? Let's say the posers. The believers and the posers, because it says, Blessed is he who so is ever shall not be offended in me. Because guess what? Sometimes God allows things in your life, and people get offended, and they turn away from God. When they feel that God has failed them, they begin to turn away because they are offended what God has allowed in their life. And we have to be able to say, All right, God, am I going to trust you? Or am I going to lean to my own understanding? Am I going to try to figure out the trials and the struggles that are coming in my life and rationalize you? Or am I going to trust you and lean not into my own understanding and put all my trust in you? Because ultimately, I believe after this, after Christ told John this, we, we read on that it wasn't long after that John the Baptist was beheaded. And I think Christ gave him that assurance to say, hey, don't be offended. Don't get bitter. Don't get all bent out of shape. I got a plan, and it's unfolding. You're part of that plan. And he began to, he began to, uh, to speak to the people and speak well of John after, after this happened. But he said, I believe he was telling John, hey, I got a plan. And it's unfolding. Don't get all bent out of shape. Don't get upset because it's not happening the way you thought it was supposed to. Don't get all upset because the things that you thought would happen are not exactly happening the way you thought. Because isn't that what the Pharisees did? When Jesus came and was doing the miracles and doing all the things that, that they knew the Messiah would come and do. But they begin to get bitter at him. They begin to get upset and all bent out of shape because it didn't happen the way they thought it should. And they were offended because of him. If you go read in John 6, and I, and, I, and I always go back to the scripture because it just speaks so loud to me. Um, when Jesus was telling him that, when Jesus was telling the multitude that he said, I'm the bread of life. He was telling them, I am the bread of life. Basically claiming his deity, saying he is God. And, and people, the Bible says that people began to be offended. And they left and walked away and didn't follow him anymore. Because he offended them. And he even asked the disciples in John 6, 67, he says, will you go away? Will you also go away? Are you offended by what I'm saying? Will you also go away? And Peter, you know, bold Peter always stood up to say, Peter said, whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. You know, the disciples, once Christ died and rose again and and the disciples began to follow him after they were scattered and all this and but they came together and received the power of the Holy Spirit I believe some of the disciples knew a lot of uh, maybe I don't I don't know how you want to say it and uh, I didn't really study this so I'm kind of going off here but the disciples knew Peter knew how he would be killed how he would die I believe he knew that because he speaks about it in, 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 in the book of Peter. He talks about, uh, he kind of uh, gives us an illustration of what would happen. And let me tell you, I believe Paul knew the things he would suffer because the Bible tells us that he was shown the things that he would suffer for the name of the Lord. He was, he was, it tells us that in Acts. And so what I'm trying to get at is these men could have been, they won't, but they could have been offended by what was told to them. Can you imagine if God told you the things that you would go through fully before you went through them? Do you know how many people would be offended and upset with God? Because let me tell you, Jonah, you take Jonah, and I wasn't even going to go here, but you know Jonah got upset and offended at God, not because of what happened to him, but because God was too good. You know that? 
He got upset because God was too good. Because there was a city that he told him to go preach to in Nineveh. And, he, and Jonah didn't want to go there. And he ended up finally going. God got him there. And uh, you know the story. But he got him there. And Jonah was more upset with God because God spared him instead of sent judgment on him. And wiped him out. People are offended at God not because of what happens. But sometimes because he's too good. The Pharisees were offended because he was too good. And he called them hypocrites. we got to remember, church, we were bought with a price. That God is in control of our lives. That he's not left us or forgotten us. That we can put our trust and in, in, in our assurance in him. But we can't get to a place where we don't are not willing to deny ourselves. And we begin to try to tell Jesus how it's supposed to be. We begin to try to tell Jesus how we want our life to be. We can't do that. that, that that's the wrong thinking because there is a heaven and a hell at stake. People are dying every day, some waking up in glory and some not. Some waking up in hell. And, and, and sometimes I think we don't think about that, that, that heaven and hell is at stake every single day. But I tell you, I don't ever want this church to get to a place where they don't want to hear the truth. We should never get to a place where we don't want to hear the truth and just want our ears tickled like the Bible says some will draw teachers just to get their ears tickled so they can leave church and feel good about themselves. We can't get to that place because there is an eternity at stake. I was just recently reading in a book and uh, the author was kind of discussing about, uh, you know, God has, having a plan for your life and things. And, and he said he would discuss with people and he would ask them, you know, what's your plan? Kind of what what, you, what is your plan for their li for your life? And, you know, some people would say, you know, depending on who he's talking to, maybe some people say, well, my plan right now is get out of high school. And he would ask the question, well, what then? And say, well, you know, go to college. Okay, what then? Say, well, you know, get a good job, start to work. Then what? He'd ask. Say, well, then eventually, you know, maybe have a family, get married, have children, do these things. He says, well, then what? He said, well, you know, retire. He says, okay, then what? I added, play golf. Yeah, that's what I think retirement is, playing golf three times a week. Maybe it's just me. I probably won't ever get there, but, you know, it's just my idea. But then he said, then what? After that, then what? Then the person would say, well, I guess I'd die. Then he said, then what? Then what? Because do you see, there's a heaven and a hell at stake. Every time we come into this church, we have to be able to look and, and, and be able to say, hey, God, we're here today not to come and just build a church, not to come and worship and do all these things, but to say, hey, are we seeking out those that are lost? Are we reaching out to those that are in need or are we always self-focused and worried about ourselves? We trust him with our reliance, their strength and ability. And we have to believe that God is able to truly get us through. I, I'm going to tell you, and, I, and it's so easy to say, but we have to get to the place in our life where we say, God, I really believe what your word says, that I, that I really believe you're not going to leave me, that I really believe you're not going to forsake me. Because Pastor Ron, again, I, and I hate to keep alluding to the first service, but he was kind of in line of what I'm preaching on now in a sense that the church people will leave you at times. People will leave you. People that you trusted will leave you. They will let you down. If you put your trust in someone and you wait long enough, they will let you down. But do we really believe God will ever let us down? Because if we do, we'll become bitter. If we don't, he'll grow us for the better. No matter how hard it is. And, and again, I'm saying this humbly. I'm not sitting up here saying that if I went through some of the struggles and trials that maybe some of you went through or that others we talk about have gone through, that I would be up here proclaiming it and saying it like I'm, you know, holier than thou. I, I, that's not my purpose this morning. And it's not my purpose to sit here and try to figure out why you're going through your or what you've gone through, why you've done. That's not it purpose of this morning's message is saying, are you truly going to trust God when the chips are down? 
Are you truly going to believe his word and say, all right, God, I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to believe that you don't leave me when I feel alone, that you're still there. When I feel that everybody has forsaken me, I'm going to believe that you're still there. When I'm scared, I'm going to believe that you're still there. Because the scripture given this morning was that if we cast, we should cast all our cares upon him because why? He cares for us. Do we really believe he cares for us? Just like when she sang the song this morning, how he loves us. Do we really believe he loves us? You know why I think sometimes we struggle with that is because we don't have love in us. Now, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, if you're a Christian, you have love in us. But I think sometimes people have that struggle that they don't even love who they are. And so they can't accept the love of God for themselves. Does that make sense? If you don't love yourself, then you're not going to let nobody love you. And if you don't let nobody love you, well, how are you going to accept God's love for you? You're going to reject it. Because you don't love yourself. I, Isaiah 40, 31 says this. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I think of that song. I don't know if y'all know it. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall rise up with wings as eagles. You know that song? They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, to wait. See, sometimes we have to be patient and wait on him. But he says, if you trust me, you wait on me to get you through these trials. You look to me, not to yourself. Lean not on your, un your own understanding, but look to me. You wait on me, and I'll renew your strength. I'll mount you up as eagles. You'll run, and you won't get weary. Because ultimately, the Bible in the New Testament talks about life as being a race. Right? That life is a race. That we're running a race. He says, you'll run and not be weary. You'll walk and not faint. Let me tell you, we have too many people that are walking and falling away. They're falling away. They're giving up. They're throwing in the towel. And, and, and for whatever reason it is, that's, that's not why I'm up here trying to discuss it. But the point is this. Are we going to believe what this word says or are we not? Are we going to look to walk with him and, and, and follow him regardless what ha could happen? Because I think, too, again, rationalizing with God, sometimes we have that anxiety to walk with God and say, hey, what is he going to make me do? What's he going to make me give up? What's he going to call me out to do? What's going to happen? What kind of trials will I face? And if I fail, is everybody going to look at me and say, yep, I knew they wouldn't last? Are they going to point their finger and say, yep, I knew that whole emotional thing they had going on at the altar that Sunday was just, you know, a phase. That, that God really didn't do a whole lot. But if we wait on him, he's able to take us, renew our strength. But we got to keep trusting in him and not looking to ourselves, but looking to him. John 10, 27 says this. If you really want to trust, now we've talked about, and I, I kind of got off my... Uh, my soapbox a little bit talking about the reliance on the Lord and 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 talking about can we rely on his strength can we rely on his ability well we've kind of I've already gave those scriptures that talk about being able to rely on his strength and and rely on his ability and rely on all the and, and our reliance in him but I want to talk about this can we truly put our confidence in him well I love what this scripture says listen to this my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now listen. And I give unto them eternal life, and they that shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them of my hand. My Father, which, has give them, which, have, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. In essence, he's telling us that when you're with him, you're following me, you're walking with me, you're in my hand. And if you're in my hand, you ain't going anywhere. 
No matter how, how far you try to run, I'm going to draw you back. It's almost like a maze. If you've ever been one of the mirror mazes, and I'm kind of scared to get in them these days, you know, because I get scared I'm going to not be able to get out. But you ever been in one of the mirror mazes? Like everywhere you turn, you can't figure out how to go nowhere because you're, tur- you, you're going in circles. I believe sometimes we do the same thing when we try to get away from God. He just says, hey, every, every turn you make is going to draw you right back to me. You can't go anywhere. You can't run away from me. I'm not going to let you go. No matter how hard you try, I'm going to keep holding you, and I'm going to keep breaking you, and I'm going to keep holding until you give up and say, Lord, I trust you, and I'm not going to lead on my understanding anymore. I want to follow you. Church, until we get to that place in God, we can trust him in our hurt, in our pain, in our disappointment, when things have been done to us, Or if it's things that we've done, we can trust him to say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me of what I've done. And I believe that I truly can follow you. And I can truly have that eternal life that you've promised for me. When things that have been done to us, we can say, Lord, forgive them. So I don't live in that pain every day. When it's hurt or disappointment or things in our life, when we feel like God has has failed us, we can say, Lord, I don't understand it, but I'm going to trust you. Because ultimately, if we believe all these things, then we have to believe what Romans 8.28 says. And y'all probably knew I was going there. Romans 8.28, all things work to the good of them that believe. That means if you're going to believe and follow him, everything is going to work to your good, even in the midst of the pain and the trial and the struggle. And if you believe that, then you're going to have your trust in the Lord and lean not to your own understanding because you have to believe that everything that God is in control of everything, even when we mess up, even when we go wrong, we got to believe that God's going to work it out for our good and bring us back to him to follow him. I, I, I trust that you have that confidence this morning. Maybe you do, maybe you don't this morning. Maybe you would say, you know what? I don't have that confidence that, that my trust is fully in him because I've tried to do it my own way for so long. Well, I can tell you that maybe today is the day that you say, all right, Lord, I give up. I've run too long trying to do it myself. I give up. And I'm going to put my trust in you today. And I'm going to surrender it all to you and say, Lord, I'm going through a hard time. But I'm going to believe that all things work to the good of them that believe. As long as I keep trusting and believing in you, you're going to work it out to my good. And you're going to keep me and not let me go. You're never going to leave me and forsake me. But you're going to keep me in that hand, in the mighty hand of God. Never to be plucked out, church. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for your word. I thank you for your service this morning, Lord. I ask you, Lord, as the word has come forth, Lord, let those, Lord, that have their trust in you today, Lord, continue trusting in you. Continue to look to you, Lord. Continue to find their strength and their assurance in you this morning when the devil would come and lie to them and say that you're lost and you're undone, and and you got this, and you got that, and he begins to condemn them and accuse them, Lord. Let them look to you, Lord, and let them be able to say there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ, Lord, that we can continue to look to you and say that you have washed my sins away as far as the east is to the west, never to be remembered against me again, Lord. Let us be it, Lord. We know, Lord, that for everything, you have a word for us. In everything that your word talked about this morning that we go through, that we deal with, that we have, Lord, you have a word for it, Lord. A word to encourage us and give us hope to press on, to to look to you, Lord. And we give you all the praise for that this morning. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that would say, I don't have that kind of trust in you this morning, Lord. That, Father, my faith is weak and Things have happened and I've gone through things that my trust is just not fully in you because I have issues. I have commitment issues. I have trust issues. I have all these kind of problems. Let them to be able to lay that aside because your word says that you're a friend that sticks closer than a brother, Lord. That you're not out to to, uh, slander us, Lord. You're not out to bring us down and and to, to destroy us, Lord. But you're out, Lord, to give us eternal life. You're out to give us hope. You're out to the Lord to look in our best interest, Lord, because we have to believe what your word says. 
that all things work to the good of them that believe. Father, if they don't have that trust today, it's my prayer this morning, Lord, that they'll be able to look to you and say, Lord, let me have that trust. Let me be able to put my trust in you this morning, Lord, and never look back. And never look back. Look to you, Lord, and press on. And say, Lord, I surrender it all to you this morning. That I know that you died for me. I know that you gave your life on that cross for me. And that you rose again. That I may be saved. That I may be sanctified. That I may be justified. And one day, Lord, be glorified for your name. And it's all because of what you've done for us. And not what we can do for ourselves. And we give you that praise. Father, Lord, I ask you, Lord, this morning. Let those that don't have that trust in you this morning. Surrender it to you this morning and say, Lord, today, today is the day that I leave this church that I'm going to trust you and I'm going to follow you all the days of my life, Lord, that no matter what happens, I'm going to believe as hard as it may be, you're going to work it out for my good in Jesus name.